Okay, last lecture we talked about uh, modifying the electrical properties of a substrate using uh, doping. We looked at a few different methods for doing so. And uh, in this lecture, we're going to talk about thermal oxidation. So this is a technique that we use to grow a layer of thermal oxide on a silicon wafer. And uh, thermal oxide, you know, silicon dioxide or silicon oxide, SiO2, is the most common um, dielectric that used in microelectronic fabrication and also MEMS fabrication. Uh, there are several reasons for that. The main thing being is one of the main reasons that it became so dominant in the industry is that it is easy to grow a film of thermal oxide, high quality thermal oxide, uh, silicon dioxide from silicon itself. So in this lecture we'll talk about how that can be done. It's a chemical reaction. You're consuming the substrate to grow this new material, film of new material on top of it. And in next lectures, we'll talk about how to deposit other materials, new types of materials, you know, even metals onto the substrate. So it's going to be about the position for the other materials. But for silicon dioxide, we are growing it. We are basically making it from the substrate itself. So in the sequence of uh, process steps that we had before, and we've seen this uh, sequence a few times already, this is the film formation, right? We talked about doping on the right side of that graph, uh, which may or may not be done in a MEMS process. Now we talk about film formation. One of the techniques is growing a layer of silicon dioxide from silicon. These layers are needed for their electrical properties, like metal layers, optical properties like silicon nitride or even some metal layers, uh, mechanical or chemical uh, applications that we may have from them. So depending on the use case, you can use different types of materials. And uh, we'll see that, you know, we mainly deposit these materials, but in case of silicon dioxide, we have more than one option. We just covered that. Silicon dioxide is glass. It's your normal glass. It is chemically stable, optically transparent, electrically and thermally insulating. Lots of interesting properties in many applications. So uh, it was a fortunate coincidence that, you know, silicon that turned out to be a fantastic material in terms of its electronic and mechanical properties has an oxide that has these additional complementary properties that actually very nicely complement what we get from silicon. It is easy to grow oxide from silicon and when we have a layer of uh, silicon dioxide it may be used in most cases for thermal or electrical isolation. It can also be used because of its optical properties. It lets light most wavelengths to go through and uh, you know you can have a, an optical sensor beneath the layer of silicon dioxide that is there for protection. We use it a lot in process to mask areas of the wafer that we want to protect from a, let's say, chemical or even physical step. So in doping, for example, the openings that you had through which you did the doping, those doping openings could be through a layer of silicon dioxide. So we can deposit or grow 500 na nanometers of silicon dioxide and create openings in that layer through which we do the doping. And we use it as a sacrificial layer. So this is uh, sacrificial layers or materials are those in MEMS processing that uh, you need them during the process, but by the end of the process, they are entirely removed. So at some point in the process, you need to have, let's say, a layer of dioc silicon dioxide to create a certain gap between two layers but by the end of the process, you remove that material entirely. So what you need in this case is process compatibility. Whatever you're using as a sacrificial layer should allow you to continue with the process and not adversely affect the rest of the following processing uh, steps. Silicon readily oxidizes in air, and uh, you always have a thin layer of silicon dioxide on the surface of your silicon wafers. Typically, the thickness is on the order of 5 to 25 nanometers, somewhere in that range. And uh, um, as soon as this layer is formed, it actually slows down the oxidation uh, 
of the rest of the vapor. So as soon as you have that 10, 20 nanometers of uh, native oxide, it is called native oxide because it grows uh, on silicon almost immediately. It stops the oxidation of the rest of the wafer and uh, protects the rest of it from oxidation, right? Now, <clears throat> one of the reasons that uh, silicon replaced germanium in microelectronic industry was actually the existence of silicon dioxide. Uh, because germanium also uh, reacts with oxygen and you have germanium dioxide as the oxide for germanium, but it is soluble in water. So germanium dioxide, if you have um, a layer of germanium dioxide, it dissolves in water. And that was a huge problem. It is still a huge problem because in microelectronic fabrication, you have a lot of wet steps, meaning that you dip them in liquids that are in most cases uh, diluted in, in water. And the oxide would be washed away every time you did that. Silicon dioxide is stable. Now, with that said, um, you can deposit silicon dioxide through different techniques, but the original one was just growing it thermally. And it is still a low cost, reliable method to deposit, to grow oxide uh, from silicon. Now, the only condition or the only requirement here is that you have to have access to the silicon. So usually this is done right, well, always, it is done right on top of your silicon wafer. And uh, if you have other materials on the surface, this process will not work. So <clears throat> there are two basic methods for the growing silicon dioxide from silicon. The first is called dry oxidation, where you bring oxygen to the surface of silicon, abundance of oxygen to the surface of silicon, and you let the two react with each other and form silicon dioxide. This doesn't happen at room temperatures or happens very, very slowly. You get the native oxide and everything stops. If you want to grow a deeper layer, you have to elevate the temperature. So usually the process is done at anywhere between 800 to 1100 degrees Celsius, uh, where you basically bring enough thermal energy into the system that you make the reaction of stable silicon and stable oxygen atom possible to form silicon dioxide. You can also do it in a wet environment, and wet in this case means that you have water in the furnace. The process is still done at about 800 to 1100 degrees Celsius, same kind of temperature, so you really don't have water. But because you have water vapor in there, you call it wet. Now, <coughs> in this case, you bring you know, water vapor to the surface of silicon, and Again, you have a reaction between silicon and oxygen, in, and you have silicon dioxide left on the surface, and hydrogen leaves the chamber. Now, I want you to just stop for a second and think about these two processes. Let's say if I'm doing oxidation at 1,000 degrees Celsius, which one of these two is going to be faster? Which one of these two is going to grow an oxide film more quickly than the other? And assuming all the other parameters, like the flow of the gas and all those things, are not limiting you, if I choose between dry oxidation and wet oxidation, which one do you think is going to grow the, thin, the oxide layer faster? <coughs> and the answer is wet oxidation. The reason for that is that when you oxidize silicon, you form this amorphous film of silicon dioxide on the surface. On the right, you see the picture of the interface between ordered crystalline silicon atoms at the bottom of the uh, interface between uh, silicon and silicon dioxide. And the, at the top, you have an amorphous film. Now, for oxidation to go forward, you need an oxygen atom or you need oxygen to go through this layer of oxide, reach the surface, the interface at the silicon, uh, SiSiO2 interface, and react with silicon to form new SiO2. And if you look at these two equations, in one case it is the oxygen atom that has, uh, oxygen molecule that has to diffuse through the, uh, in the existing silicon dioxide layer. In the other case, it is the water molecule that has to 
diffuse. And as it turns out, water is a water molecule is smaller than an oxygen molecule. So it is uh, penetrating through that layer faster, easier, and therefore the oxidation rate is higher for wet oxidation. Generally, dry oxidation gives you a higher quality film, but at a much slower speed. And you can use wet oxidation to grow films maybe as thick as even one and a half, two microns if necessary. So as it turned out, it's a diffusion equation again that you have to deal with. And uh, a couple of fellows in the 60s figured out uh, that at the end of the story, you can find out the thickness of the oxide layer, T ox, from this simple equation, this quadratic equation, that says the thickness of the oxide squared plus A times T ox is given by a constant on the right side of the equation, B times T plus tau. Where in this case, A, B, and tau are constants that are determined empirically. There's actually theoretical backing for them as well. And uh, tau here accounts for the initial oxide thickness on the surface. So T is the oxidation time. A and B depend on whether you're doing wet oxidation or dry oxidation, the temperature of the oxidation and the uh, uh, orientation of the wafer that you have. As we said, you know, uh, different orientations have different level of uh, different numbers of uh, silicon atoms exposed in the crystal. And therefore, your oxidation rates will also be different for different uh, crystal planes. Now, so A, B, and T depend on the process. Uh, tau accounts for the initial thickness of the oxide. So if you have only native oxide on the surface, it can be found from a table like this. So for example, at 800 degrees Celsius for 100 wafer uh, dry etching, A is 0.859 micrometers, B is 0 0.001, and tau is 17.1, right? What that means is that at 800 degrees, it almost takes 17 hours to grow that about 20 nanometers of native oxide. And, uh, you know, if you do it with wet oxidation, it's down to one hour, right? Now, if you go up in temperature to 1,000 degrees, things happen much quick, more quickly, obviously, because you have more, uh, the, the whole diffusion process and reaction will proceed faster at higher temperatures. If you plot these equations versus time for different uh, temperatures and with different, let's say, types of process, wet versus dry, you can see that it, it's going to follow like this, right? So you have this <coughs> rapid initial uh, increase in the film thickness, and things slow down after about a couple of hours, maybe three, four hours, uh, and they do not, the oxide thickness starts to grow much more slowly. Um, all the uh, solid lines here are wet oxidation. So, you know, let's say 1,200 degrees wet oxidation after 15 hours, you get about three and a half micrometers of uh, oxide grown on top of a native uh, bare wafer. But if you do it at dry oxidation, you barely get half a micron. So it just shows you the difference between wet and dry oxidation, noting that 1,200 degrees is quite high. Right? So usually we keep it to about 1,100 degrees or so, uh, maybe 1,000 to, to 1,100 degrees Celsius. Um, so if you want a thicker film, and usually the thicknesses we need are between 500 nanometers to 2 microns. We go with the wet oxide uh, method. If we want more control over the film thickness, we may go for a dry oxidation. Now, let's go through one example here. The example says that we are doing wet oxidation at 1,000 degrees Celsius, and we want to find out how much time it takes to grow 800 nanometers of oxide on a uh, 100 wafer uh, with only native oxide on it. And here are the coefficients that we can use. So let me switch to my tablet and go through this solution together here. So again, summarizing what we had, uh, ox wet oxidation at 1,000 degrees Celsius. So what this lets me do is that I can go and figure out the um, coefficients I need for the deal groove model, deal and groove, where the scientists that came up with that quadratic equation 
and uh, Andy Goof may be familiar to some of you. He's the founder of Intel. Uh, but anyway, Deal Goof uh, model is uh, the quadratic equation that we saw for thermal oxidation. So if I go and check that table, I will see that A is uh, 0.424, B is 0.316 micrometer per hour, and tau is 0.0355 hours, right? And the question is, how much time does it take uh, time to grow, time for, let's say, T oxide equal to 800 nanometers or 0.8 micrometers. Okay, so I go and look at the equation. It is T oxide squared plus A T ox is equal to B times T plus tau. I have all the parameters that I need here. Right? So the T oxide is 0.8, A, B, and tau, I already looked them up, and then therefore I can easily calculate T. And in this case, T is going to be 3.06 hours. Okay? So the second part of this question is what happens if I already have 300 nanometers of oxide on the wafer. So I have 300 nanometers of oxide. I want to go to 800 nanometers of oxide. So I want to grow 500 nanometers more. The question is that how much time do I need for that? Time to go, let's say, from 300 nanometers to 800 nanometers. So in this case, I don't have a bare wafer anymore. This is an oxidized wafer. And I need to figure out how much time is needed to, <coughs> to oxidize the uh, additional 500 nanometers, or to have another additional 500 nanometers of oxide. The way I can look at this problem is that I can say, OK, I'm going to assume that I'm going to oxidize the silicon all the way to 800 nanometers at this 1,000 degrees Celsius and so on and so forth. I already know I need about three and a half, three hours and, uh, for that. Now, I'm not starting from zero. I'm starting from 300 nanometers. So what I can do is that I can figure out how much time I need to grow the first 300 nanometers of oxide under those conditions and then subtract it from the three hours that, of the total time for 800 nanometer film. So knowing that, so I can say that, okay, so I figure out what is the time required to grow 0.3 nanometers. And this gives me, let's say, T.3 micrometer is 0.65 hours. I know I need three hours to grow 800 nanometers. I know uh, the first 0.65 hours will be spent on growing the first 300 nanometers. If I'm starting the, uh, from 300 nanometers, I only have to worry about the difference. So therefore, you can see that, let's just call it delta T here. Uh, delta T is 3.06 hours minus 0.65 and that's 2.41 hours. So if I want to go from 300 nanometers to 800 nanometers, I only need about 2.4 hours, okay? And this is how I treat uh, the oxidation problems with uh, existing oxide on the surface, right? So I go and look at how much time I would have needed under similar oxidation uh, conditions to grow that existing oxide thickness, and then what is it, the final one that I want to have, and then subtract the, the two times from each other to, to find the difference. Now, how do I figure out the thickness of the oxide? Well, you can use the formula to have a, um, 
an idea about the final thickness of the oxide on your wafer, the challenge is that, you know, things do not work perfectly. You may have a slight deviation in the temperature in your furnace. The gas flow may be affecting the performance of the uh, oxidation furnace a bit. Uh, time may be of an issue. And sometimes you just get the wafer from somebody else. And there is some oxide on it, and you want to figure out what is the thickness of that oxide. Now, there are tools for that. These are called... Um, ellipsometers that actually the way they work is that they look at the uh, diffraction of different wavelengths of light as they travel through the oxide thickness and reflect it back from the interface with silicon at the bottom. And by going through a large number of the wavelengths, they can actually estimate the thickness of the oxide fairly accurately for you. But you can also look at the color of that oxide. And then this is again one of those cases where I could show you a silicon wafer here in classroom so that you could see the different colors. But as you grow the oxide film, uh, each thickness will, has its own, will have its own characteristic color. So you can see on the right side that you will start from, let's say, red, and then you go all the way to blue, and then it just repeats, right? Because as you uh, add this thickness of the, to the thickness of the oxide layer, Light comes in and then is reflected back from the interface with silicon. Uh, as it goes back and leaves oxide, goes back to air, you can have destructive or constructive uh, interference with incoming light. And then you have constructive interference only at one wavelength. So if you know the uh, refractive index of glass or, or silicon dioxide, you can figure out what was that thickness, right? So from the color, from the wavelength that is reflected. But, you know, add another half wavelength to this thickness and the same thing happens. So this color range will repeat. You will get, you know, blue for a couple of different thicknesses in your normal thickness range for oxides. And same thing with purple and same thing with green. All of them will repeat themselves as you add to the thickness of the film. So it's not going to work that well unless you have an idea. So if you know that your film is about, let's say, 0.25 micrometers thick, and it is, let's say, gold, then it is 0.22. But if it is, you know, bluish, then it is probably closer to 0.3. So as long as you have some idea about the relative thickness or rough thickness uh, of the film, you can go and use this chart, and it is actually in, in research labs. It is um, printed and placed right next to the furnace so that the student that takes the wafer out can immediately see if they are in the right neighborhood or not. But, uh, you know, on a silicon wafer that is processed and has all these different thicknesses of the, the dielectrics on it, you see this rainbow of colors, and it is amazing, and those colors are the purest colors that you ever see. You know, this is the purest way of producing a single wavelength uh, color by just having a well-defined dielectric layer there that filters everything else and just lets one wavelength to go through. So anyway, so that's the discussion about thermal oxidation. And uh, in the next lecture, we're going to start the discussion about depositing other types of materials on the wafers instead of just relying on the silicon uh, to grow the film. We can have, you know, metals and other types of materials and dielectrics uh, deposited on the surface in different ways.